So this, this time I will be talking about uh, reinforcement learning uh, for NLP. Um, and this is part of our three-part series on kind of different training methods other than, uh, you know, the standard maximum likelihood that we've been using for all our decisions up until now for structured prediction problems. Um, and this was in the reading, so I assume that people largely know this already, but what is reinforcement learning? And it's learning algorithms where we have um, an environment, X, ability to make actions A, and we get a delayed reward R. Um, and the example of Pong, which uh, you, you read about, was uh, X is our observed image, A is up or down, and R is the win-loss at the end of the game. Um, so um, why would we want to use reinforcement learning in NLP? And I think there's a number of reasons why we'd want to use reinforcement learning. Um, the first one, we may have a typical reinforcement learning scenario where we have actions, um, uh, you know, an environment and actions, and we can make responses and we'll get a reward at the end. So a couple examples of this include um, dialogue. So dialogue is one of the few places that has been using reinforcement learning forever uh, in natural language processing. And the reason why is because you are talking with somebody and then at the very end you get some sort of reward about whether you did a good job or not. So like, for example, if you have a uh, airline ticket sales system, um, the person will be talking with the airline ticket sales system and if they buy a ticket at the end, then you did a good job, you get a reward. Um, other examples are like playing text-based games. So if you have, uh, um, oh, what's, what's the name of the text-based game? Uh, where you get eaten by a guru. Is anybody uh, old enough to remember that? <laughs> what? Zork. Zork. Yeah, Zork, right, yeah. So uh, there's a famous text-based game where you're, uh, where you're wandering around, and if you end up wandering around in a dark place for too long, you get eaten by a guru, and that's your negative reward. So. Um, I'm glad at least one person. Uh, <laughs> Another reason why you might want to do reinforcement learning in NLP is uh, because you have some uh, latent variables, so latent probabilistic variables uh, that you want to do some sort of optimization over. Uh, so you might know your output, your inputs and your outputs. So your input might be text and your output might be uh, a label or something like that. But in order to get the label, you might choose the structure of the sentence, like a tree structure of the sentence, um, kind of dynamically to give you the best uh, prediction results. Uh, this would be another example. And I'll give more examples of this later. Um, or we may have some sort of sequence level error function, such as blue score or hamming distance or, uh, or F measure or something like that, that we want to optimize. Um, and we can't uh, calculate it until we uh, first generate the whole sequence. So the reason why I'm splitting these three into, um, into three types is because they actually decide the class of uh, functions that we are able to use. And um, you can use reinforcement learning to do any of these, but you don't necessarily need to use reinforcement learning to do, uh, to do some of these. Um, so I'll, I'll get back to that later. But um, first, just to go very quickly through the policy gradient, um, I'm going to explain this from a, a slightly different perspective than the blog, but I think it will be pretty similar. Uh, so in supervised learning, uh, we're given correct decisions. Um, and then we can calculate the, uh, the log likelihood of an output. So let's say this is a sequence sequence model uh, where we have an input x and an output y. Um, the negative log likelihood is what we use for optimizing our model. Um, in the context of reinforcement learning, um, this can be considered as something called imitation learning, where imitation learning is basically uh, following what a teacher tells us to do. So we also talk about teacher forcing, right? You know, um, we have these kind of pedag pedagogical uh, analogies to, uh, to learning algorithms. So we have our teacher and the student is imitating the teacher, et cetera. So this is where we have our gold standard sequence of actions. Um, and then there's also uh, self-training. So self-training, basically what this means is um, we sample or argmax according to the current model, um, and we get an output y hat. We use this uh, sample or samples to maximize likelihood, um, and we calculate exactly the same log likelihood uh, loss here. So, um, so yes? <laughs> 
No correct uh, answer is needed here, actually. So you could do this in situations where you only have x, right? Because we're generating y hat according to our current model. Um, so does this seem like a good idea? Any, any ideas about this? Um, yes? Who, th who thinks yes? Who thinks no? OK. Um, why do you think no? I feel like if your probability distribution is off, you're just going to get further into the woods if you keep saying things like that. Yeah, so you're, you're basically going to reinforce the mistakes that your model is already making. So you, know, you, generate, you generate something according to your, uh, your model, and then you improve the probability of that thing. But if that thing's wrong, right, you're going to you know, just make your model worse. That being said, self-training does sometimes work. So for example, um, if you have lots of easy examples uh, that you can output um, and your model is right a lot of the time, this will, you know, this will maybe, maybe work, maybe not. Um, one example uh, that's very similar to self-training um, that works is co-training. And what co-training is, is basically you, um, you take two models, maybe you have one sequence to sequence model and you have one uh, tree to sequence model or something like that, two different models. You generate the outputs and you only use the outputs where the two models agree to train your model. And this helps prevent you know, the mistakes of any single model and can improve. And this is also very similar to like model distillation, um, which we'll be talking about later as well. So, Policy gradient or reinforce uh, basically adds a term that scales the loss by the reward. So you have the reward here. Um, this reward can be something like uh, a one minus blue score or one minus Hamming distance or something like this. And the only difference between this and self-training, sorry, this should actually be um, this should actually be reinforce. The only difference between this and self-training is that now we're multiplying this by the reward. Now this seems like a, a lot better of an idea, right? So if our reward is between zero and one, for example, that's saying if we get a really high reward close to one because we did a good job, uh, then we're going to be updating just like we would be doing uh, in self-training. But if we get a low reward, we're not going to be updating our model very much. Um, the only problem here is that in contrast to self-training, now we need um, y to calculate our reward, or we need some other way to calculate the reward uh, that doesn't solely rely on the output that we generated. But the good news is very often we can get something like this. So here's a quiz. Um, under what conditions is this equal to uh, maximum likelihood estimation? Or uh, essentially equal to maximum likelihood estimation. And specifically, what function for R could you choose that would make this equal to maximum likelihood? Yes, exactly, the zero one loss, or the zero one function, where if y and y hat are exactly the same, uh, then you, uh, you take the log uh, likelihood. If it's, they're not the same, you take zero. So um, interestingly, like if you think about uh, something like a sequence to sequence model, um, the uh, maximum likelihood objective is the same as the reinforce objective uh, when you penalize all of the sentences that are, uh, that are like, wrong at all by like one word, for example. Um, so uh, one problem with uh, reinforcement learning is credit assignment. Um, and so the, the reason uh, why this is difficult is how we don't necessarily know which actions led to the reward. So the best scenario is when we get an immediate reward immediately after we take an action. So for example, um, we generate a word, we get a reward, we get no reward, we generate a word, we get a plus one reward, and we step all the way through. And the reason why this is good is because basically um, we can guess which action uh, gave us uh, the reward. And in maximum likelihood, uh, if we think about this from the framework of uh, something like maximum likelihood training, one of the reasons why maximum likelihood training is good is we know which words the model predicted well, um, and we know which words the model predicted wrong. So in maximum likelihood, for example, if we can do maximum likelihood for our problem, we don't have this problem with credit assignment uh, for you know, which action in the sequence uh, gave us the output. Then the worst scenario is only at the end of the rollout, uh, where we only get a reward at the very end. 
Um, and then we try to guess, essentially, which of the actions was the one that gave us a good score, which gave us a bad score. So the re one of the reasons why reinforcement learning uh, for NLP is hard is many of the cases where we do reinforcement learning for NLP, we're considering only rewards we get at the end of a long sequence of actions. Um, so that, that's uh, something we need to keep in mind. Um, if we get this immediate reward, it's very common to assign decaying rewards for future events uh, to take into account the time delay between the action and the reward. So for example, we might give a small reward to action one um, if we know that at action two we got plus one. So this would be like a way of uh, improving our credit assignment. Okay, um, so I think the basic concepts were, were maybe covered in the reading. So is this okay? Are there any additional follow-ups or things? Okay. Um, so problems with reinforcement learning. Um, so one problem with reinforcement learning is like other sampling-based methods, um, it can be unstable. Um, like it said in the reading, it can be unstable with large action spaces. So for the example of Pong is a really good example because our action space is two, right? You can either go up or down. Um, in sequence, sequence models, this is a really bad example, right? Because your action space is the size of your output vocabulary. So your action space can be 10,000 or 100,000 or something, um, which is uh, very scary. Um, yeah, so that's exactly right. Um, so in order to make this work at all, um, you need to use a couple of strategies. Um, the first strategy that you should be using in any reinforcement learning method that you implement is uh, adding a baseline. Um, so the basic idea is that we have ex expectations about our reward, uh, for example, for a particular sentence. So let's say we need to, um, uh, let's say we need to translate, uh, this is an easy sentence, or we need to translate buffalo, buffalo, buffalo. Um, Buffalo, buffalo, buffalo is also a sentence. Have people heard about this? Yeah. Where, where, did you hear about it in a class or no? Which class? I think it was algorithms for algorithms for NLP. Okay, so mo many people know this, but there's a there's a famous sentence: uh, buffalo, 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 which is actually a grammatical uh, English sentence, and you can look it up on Wikipedia if you want to know the actual uh, interpretation. Um, but anyway, if we get that, that would be a particularly difficult one to process, of course. Um, so let's say we, we run our tagging model or our sequence to sequence model or whatever, and we get a reward of 0 0.8 for this one and 0 0.3 for this one. The problem is um, this reward is lower, so we might update uh, our model in, the, in a bad direction or update our model less. But actually, if we think about what we expected to get for each of these sentences, um, for this particular sentence, um, we might expect a priori to do really well on it, and then 0 0.8 is actually worse. So, like, let's say I knew, um, I know the quiz today was probably easier than the quiz on Tuesday. Um, you know, uh, if people did well on the quiz today, I would be a little bit less impressed than if they did well on the quiz on Tuesday, for example. Um, so. What we do is instead of multiplying by the reward itself, um, we might multiply by the baseline uh, minus the reward. Or actually, sorry, reward reward minus the baseline. Sorry, these, these are, are backwards. Um, we might multiply by the reward minus the baseline. And basically, that says that this particular uh, example did worse than we expected. Uh, this particular example did better than we expected. Um, and this is an intuitive uh, explanation. Um, oh, yeah, and here's the equation here. Um, also, from a, a machine learning perspective, if you think about what this is doing, this is reducing the, um, the variance of the thing that we're multiplying by. So normally, we'll have lots of variance uh, in the reward based on uh, how difficult the sentence is. But if we add in our baseline, this will reduce the variance and keep things more or less centered around one, which is a good thing from a, a learning perspective. Um, are there any questions about this? Um, yeah. So the baseline is uh, set by the task, right? So for example, if we got this sentence, this is an easy sentence from a translation, mm -hmm. or from a paraphrase, the baseline would be set by the task. 
They're set task by task. And actually, uh, I realize I should talk about that next uh, before, uh, before this. So there's a bunch of different ways to calculate baselines. Um, the choice of the baseline is more or less arbitrary and won't really, uh, you know, it'll only make the algorithm converge better. You could set your baseline to zero and reinforce would still be doing the right thing. It just would have higher variance in its learning. Um, but one example of how people uh, predict baselines is you calculate some representation of the current sentence or the current state, and um, you, you then uh, train something to predict the final reward based on the, some representation of the input sentence or some representation of the current state. So an example of this would be, um, again, in a sequence, sequence model, you would take maybe the final state of the encoder um, and use it to predict the reward. So every time you do a, a batch, you um, every time you do a batch, you calculate the reward, and then you pr train a linear regressor to predict that reward based on the, the hidden state. So the idea being that um, maybe the hidden state of this is an easy sentence would make it seem like this is a very simple sentence to translate, and the final state of buffalo, buffalo, buffalo would make it seem like this is a very hard sentence to translate. Um, you can also do this on a uh, on a action by action basis. So for example, um, you could have uh, the decoder hidden state uh, predict for each action uh, what reward you would expect. And that's what uh, they do in this paper, Ron's auto at all. Yes. Um, another thing that, uh, that actually works quite well, um, this may be a little bit less uh, theoretically uh, well-founded, but um, another thing that you can think about is, for example, as the model um, gets better, as the model gets better, essentially the uh, reward you'll be able to expect is going to increase, right? Your model's going to be improving its reward. So what you can do is you can take um, the average of the rewards in a batch um, and the, use the average of the rewards in the batch as your baseline. So this is, um, this is saying, now according to the current model, the current model can expect to get about a reward of 0 0.5. Uh, some sentences you did better, some sentences you did worse. Um, and uh, this allows you to, uh, to basically adjust for the overall model, overall ability of the model. Um, so there's a bunch of different ways you can do this, but basically, um, the, uh, the better the baseline is at predicting the reward, the more it will uh, kind of reduce the variance. Um, so, yeah, sorry, one, one thing I should just reiterate is um, the, unfortunately, reinforcement learning is very unstable and there's lots of little things. The things I'm going to be talking about here are kind of recipes that I've used in the past to make it actually work, uh, specifically for sequence-to-sequence -sequence models. And I think sequence-to-sequence -sequence models are kind of a worst case scenario because their vocabularies are very large. Um, so the things that I, I have used here will probably translate into kind of simpler ones where your, uh, your output space isn't quite as big. But calculating baselines is one thing that you definitely should be doing. Um, another thing is increasing batch size. So um, when you're doing reinforcement learning, if you're doing sampling or some sort of beam search uh, related thing, um, uh, because each sample will be high variance, um, we can also sample many different examples before performing an update. So, you know, we can, instead of doing, you know, one sentence at a time and updating sentence by sentence, you can um, increase the number of examples uh, done before an update. So you can do like 32 examples before an update, 64 examples before an update. Um, Another thing that you can do, I don't see this used very much in NLP, but it's used in other things like game playing where you have really long uh, sequences, is uh, to save previous rollouts and just reuse them when you update the parameters. So the idea behind this is basically um, something like sampling uh, might be expensive, uh, might be an expensive operation, especially if you're doing some sort of search, uh, like beam search or whatever to get uh, the samples that you want. So you can use the samples that you've already gotten from previous examples and just revisit them after you've updated the model parameters a lot later. Um, so this is called experience replay, but it's, uh, it's good when you have a very expensive sampling process. 
Um, are there, yeah, are there any questions about this? So, okay. Um, so, uh, the next thing, I've already kind of talked about this, so I'll just go quickly. So, warm start basically, um, you start training with maximum likelihood and then switch over to reinforce. Um, the thing that I want to stress about this is last time when I was talking about like maximum margin methods, uh, for example, the maximum margin methods are only applicable in situations where we could also probably do maximum likelihood training. Uh, okay, no, sorry, that, that's, not, that's not the case, sorry. Um, but I mainly talked about maximum uh, margin methods in the context of examples where we could also do maximum likelihood training. So where we had gold, uh, where we had gold labels. So if you have gold labels, like in training a sequence to sequence model or a, um, or a tagging model, um, in this case, uh, you can train with maximum likelihood first and then uh, move over into, uh, into training with reinforce for some other objective function like blue score or whatever else you wanted to calculate. Um, this does not work in two of the other cases that I mentioned. So like the cases with latent variables or um, in kind of standard RL settings. And the reason why it doesn't work here is we don't know the gold standard action sequence. And if you don't know the gold standard action sequence, you can't do uh, fully supervised learning in the first place. Um, one example of this is Mixer. Um, it's, it basically uh, starts with MLE and uh, gradually tran uh, transitions uh, from uh, MLE to the full objective. Um, and another example of this is where you start out, you pre-train your model using MLE, and then, you, um, and then you train using the full objective, but you also do MLE updates every once in a while. So you sample uh, 10 batches worth of a reinforcement learning objective and then one worth of the MLE objective to keep things stable. So um, there's various uh, combinations of uh, MLE and, uh, and reinforcement learning objectives. So to go back um, uh, to this, I mentioned there's a lot of different problems we could uh, solve, uh, we could try to solve. So um, in a setting where we, the correct actions are not given, um, and especially in the setting where the structure of the computation depends on the choices you make. Uh, so for example, um, let's say we have a, uh, Let's say we have a latent tree learning model um, where you sample a tree structure and then you do computation based on the tree structure. Um, for many instances of this computation, for many instances of this, basically the computation that you do will change based on the tree structure you sample. Um, and, uh, or um, another example would be uh, in the dialogue setting where you give a output and then from some oracle you get um, uh, you get a response um, and based on that response you need to take your next output so um, uh, the, the type of computation you do depends on the uh, on, on your output um, in this case you basically have no other choice you have to use something like reinforcement learning or um, or a similar uh, or a similar thing like this. Um, if you're in a setting where correct actions are not given, uh, but the computation structure doesn't change, um, an example like this would be, uh, let's say, a, um, let's say you have a, uh, Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think of a good example. Let's say you have a, a part of speech tagging model or something like this, uh, where the the part of speech tags are latent variables that you need to optimize over. Um, if you have an example like this, uh, the computation structure doesn't change. You're still going to be predicting a part of speech tag for each uh, for each output, um, but um, but then uh, you don't know the actual correct actions. In this case, you can use other uh, differentiable approximations, uh, such as Gumbel softmax, um, which I'll be talking about later. 
Um, so basically what I want to say is if your computation graph doesn't change as a result of your actions, uh, then there are other things that you can do uh, as well. So I'll, I'll talk about this uh, it, later. Points in place. And then if you can train using MLE, uh, but want to use a non-decomposable -decompo loss function, uh, you could do this, uh, but there are actually many other methods that you can use. You can do warm start with MLE, uh, you can use max margin methods, you can use minimum risk methods. So um, the reason why I want to point this out is because um, if you don't know a whole lot about structured prediction, uh, but you do hear a whole lot about reinforcement learning via like DeepMind playing StarCraft or Go or something like this, you might think that all of your NLP problems should be reinforcement learning problems. Uh, but in reality, um, reinforcement learning is great for Go and uh, StarCraft because you don't know the gold standard action sequence and the type of computation you're doing uh, depends on, on the result. So there they have no choice, which is why they're using it. Uh, but in many NLP problems, we do have other options. So you should, you should think about using those other options as well because they can be much more stable and reliable. Um, okay. Uh, are there any questions about, uh, about this? Or Does anyone have an example that they uh, would like to know where it falls? Is it okay? Okay. Um, so there are alternative uh, reinforcement learning methods. So an alternative is uh, value-based reinforcement learning. So uh, policy-based versus value-based reinforcement learning um, uh, Policy-based learning tries to learn a good probabilistic policy uh, that maximizes the expectation of the reward. Um, so basically, you're learning a probabilistic function that each step calculates a probability distribution over the, uh, over the actions. Whereas uh, value-based learning uh, tries to guess the value of the result of taking a particular action and takes action with the highest expected value. So um, the action value function, basically given the state S, we try to uh, estimate the value of each action A. So um, in this case, the value is the expected reward given that you take that action. So um, if you have action T, A, T, um, you could calculate the reward over all the you know, paths that you do after taking that action um, and take the expectation over it. And, uh, and this gives you your, uh, your action value function, which is also uh, often called the Q function. So to give an example, the state S might be the input and all of the previous generated words. The action would be the next word to uh, translate. And the value that you would get from this would be something like blue score that you get at the end of the sentence, given that you took that action. So if you generate a good word, probably you'll be able to generate a good sentence. So the value will be relatively high. And uh, get, if you generate a bad word, then the, the value will be relatively low. Um, and we then take the action that maximizes this, uh, sorry, not reward, maximizes the value. Like this. So one thing to note here is this doesn't necessarily need to be a probabilistic model. Um, we have the expectation here, so it kind of, you know, um, you kind of might figure there's a probability somewhere in here, but if you consider a deterministic policy in a deterministic world, uh, you don't necessarily have to have probability any, anywhere in this, uh, in this model. Um, so there's lots of ways to estimate value functions. Um, a simple way of doing this um, is tabular queue learning. So I actually implemented this in my machine learning class for my undergrad, uh, where you had a taxi driver, and the taxi driver had to find the best route to the... Uh, output in a grid, in a like 10 by 10 grid world. So in the 10 by 10 grid world, you only have 10, uh, 10 by 10 states. You only have 100 states. Um, and you only, have, uh, you only have up to four actions, because you can only go up, down, left, or right. So if this is the case, you only have 10 by 10 by 4. So you only have 400 uh, possible combinations of S and A. So you can just remember all of them. And you do lots and lots of trials, and you figure out which one gives you the best uh, reward. Um, and then uh, to do Q learning in this, uh, in this setting, uh, basically what you do is you take your old Q function, 
and you do some sort of update of it where you decrease the value of the Q function that you had before and you, um, you add in the reward here. So um, unfortunately, most interesting problems, we don't have finite states and we don't have um, a, a small enough action space that we can remember all of them. Uh, so you can use uh, neural networks to estimate this. Um, and neural Q function approximation, uh, performing regression with neural networks, uh, actually came from uh, Tesoro uh, 1995. Does anyone know uh, what this, uh, what problem they tackled here? Yeah. Backgammon. Wow, you're the other old person in the room and you're not even that old. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, so backgammon, yes. Uh, so this was actually one of the big, really big early successes of neural nets in like game playing where uh, they actually beat expert backgammon players at the, at the game of backgammon, which is actually a pretty hard game. It has, you know, probability and, uh, and stuff like this. So um, probabilistic choices. Uh, but um, yeah, this has been around for a long time. Um, so if you do Q learning, um, there's a problem of exploration versus exploitation. And this is actually a problem in policy gradient methods as well. Um, and so basically, uh, once the model learns um, what to do, and it, it found some kind of semi-good answer. Maybe, uh, maybe it finds a very kind of greedy policy that takes the best looking action every single time. Um, it's very easy to fall into local optima where you have a pretty good policy that's never quite as good uh, ever. And in, a very common example of this is uh, multi-armed bandits. And a multi-armed bandit is basically um, a, a thing where you can, um, it's like a slot machine where you pull an arm and you can you have two arms on the slot machine or more and um, if you pick the left arm on the slot machine if you pull this um, you put in uh, you put in one dollar and it gives you uh, one dollar and one cent every time uh, so you always get a, a gain of 0 0.01 and then you have another one over here uh, where you put in one dollar and 10% of the time you lose everything and 90% uh, of the time you get fifty dollars. So if you think about it, the one on the right is the much better one, right? So um, you want to, uh, you, it, eventually you would want to get uh, the one on the right because you have a much higher expected reward. But once you realize you can get one cent on the left side and zero cents on the right side, you might just keep on pulling the left one even though it's suboptimal. So, um, the, uh, this is particularly a problem for Q-learning because for Q-learning every single time, or sorry, for uh, uh, value-based reinforcement learning because if you don't have a probabilistic policy and just take the maximum every time, uh, you will get stuck. Uh, um, you will get stuck and you'll have no way of escaping. Um, if you have a stochastic policy, you're still randomly sampling actions, so you still have a chance to escape from this, uh, right? So it's a little bit less of a problem in a policy gradient. Um, but uh, the solution here is every once in a while you can randomly pick an action with a certain probability uh, epsilon. Uh, and this is called the epsilon greedy strategy. Um, and basically what this does is this, um, uh, and this allows you to, uh, you know, occasionally explore other options. And you might eventually find out that this one sometimes gives you uh, this one sometimes gives you lots of money and you want to reconsider not pulling it over. There's also a recent and very interesting work on uh, something called intrinsic reward. And the idea of intrinsic reward is you want to give models more, um, uh, basically you give the models reward for exploring and trying out new things that they haven't tried very much before. Um, so I, I shouldn't say this is a new, uh, a recent thing. It's been around forever. And if you don't cite uh, Jürgen Schmidt Huber, you get in trouble. Uh, so, um, uh, but th this gives rewards to models that discover new states. And this is good for things like, um, you know, a dialogue system or something, which uh, the dialogue system, if you say hello to it every single time, it might say hello back to you. And that's not very interesting. But every once in a while, it could try something new and say, you know, 
not just hello, but um, you know, hey, did you hear uh, did you hear what X said on Twitter today or something like that? Mm -hmm. You know, maybe, maybe that would be uh, maybe that would be a better reward some of the time, and you should try you should try that. Um, one thing I should stress is this is a really really big problem, um, and I've tried to do uh, I've tried to do interesting things with reinforcement learning, and uh, not being able to handle this problem well uh, has caused those interesting things to not work very well. And maybe I'll, I'll talk about them a little bit, get back to them after we go through the examples of uh, applications, but um, yeah. Are there any, uh, any questions about this? Okay. Um, so examples of reinforcement learning, as I said, um, the first example of reinforcement learning uh, in NLP that has been around for a really long time is reinforcement learning in dialogue. And the reason why it's in dialogue is it's a very obvious um, situation where you really need to use reinforcement learning uh, in order to learn well. Um, uh, Young et al. have a survey. This was before neural networks, but it talks about so many different aspects of reinforcement learning in dialogue, uh, and it's, it's very good. Uh, Steve Young's group was uh, one of the major drivers behind this. Um, but they, um, the standard tools that they use here are uh, Markov decision processes and also things like partially observed Markov decision processes. And the idea behind partially observed Markov decision processes is kind of like you have latent variables that you don't know the values of. Um, one example is for spoken dialogue, uh, you might have noisy speech recognition results that you're trying to learn from. And you don't know which of the speech recognition results is correct, so you need to kind of figure out which one was correct as you go through the dialogue. Um, now there are neural network models for both task-based and uh, chatbot dialogue. Um, this is kind of an, uh, an interesting field here. I feel like a lot of them have been working on, um, on chatbot dialogue. And chatbot dialogue, kind of from a reinforcement learning perspective, is much less interesting. Uh, because it's much harder to define a reward function. It's much harder to say whether you're doing a good job at dialogue. And it's much easier to just train using maximum likelihood on data from Twitter or, uh, or movies or uh, service logs or something like that. Task-based dialogue, you have, very clear, um, you have very clear reward metrics. Like um, if you want to sell airplane tickets using, an online, uh, using a phone-based system, did you sell an airplane ticket is a very good reward measure, right? Um, but it's very hard to get you know, good examples. And even people who are selling tickets, even humans who are selling tickets, might not be doing the ideal strategies. So um, if you're interested in reinforcement learning uh, type methods, I, I think task-based dialogue is something interesting to look at. But uh, um, yeah. Another thing that maybe people don't know uh, a whole lot is that there's an interesting uh, way of doing this without actually interacting with humans every time you want to train your model, uh, which is user simulators. Um, this is essentially data augmentation for uh, for learning uh, dialogues through uh, dialogue systems through reinforcement learning. So the problem is, if you want to do task-based dialogue, it's very hard to get data. It's very hard to get a million users to talk with your system, especially when your system is really horrible at the very beginning and you know, saying hello all the time uh, because it hasn't explored enough yet. So um, one solution to this is to create a user simulator. Um, and the user simulator has an internal state uh, that you don't actually show to the system directly. The only thing you show to the system is the utterances that the user simulator makes. And so the dialogue um, system must essentially learn to track the user state with incomplete information. So this is the user kind of um, the user intent. They want to find a bar uh, that sells beer that's in the central area. Um, and based on this, the user simulator picks a um, kind of like the information that it wants to tell the system. This is gen then turned into, a, um, into an utterance. Maybe this utterance is passed through simulated ASR, so simulated speech recognition that messes up some of the words. And then um, the system tries to reply to it. So maybe it says, OK, a wine bar, because there was a simulated uh, error on beer here. Um, 
And so then based on this, uh, the user simulator uh, looks at the system utterance and says, uh, no, not wine, beer. So then it says, no beer, please. And so the only thing the system is able to uh, observe is the system and user utterances. But from this, it needs to kind of disentangle the state that it had uh, underneath. Are there any questions about, uh, about these things? No. Okay. So the next one, um, this is some uh, a research area that I'm interested in, but I also think this is one of the cleverest papers I've uh, ever read in natural language processing. Um, it won one best paper in 2009, and it was a thing way before its time. Um, and it's a paper on mapping instructions to actions. And basically, you learn a, uh, you learn a system that learns to read the Windows manual and use Windows. Um, and the way it works is basically the, what, Windows, what the man, Windows manual looks like is click run and press OK after typing secpol.msc in the open box. And the, um, the system can click anywhere on the screen, essentially. So it can do any you know, of the normal actions a Windows user can use. And um, based on that, it clicks run. And now, um, now it gets this dialog box. It types in uh, secpol.msc into the dialog box. Um, and then it presses OK. So this is kind of like the action space of the things it's allowed to do. Um, so how, what kind of reward function do you think they defined for this, uh, this task? Any ideas? I think this is the really clever part. Any guesses? What, what's that? The time it takes for it to perform correct actions. The time it takes for it to perform correct actions. Yes and no. Uh, they kind of uh, do take this new, into account because your reward decays over the time steps. So if you if you do it quickly, you get you get a reward. But um, yeah. What is the change in the pixels? That's a really good idea, but that's not what they did. Um, that would be like a uh, a curiosity-based or um, a, an objective where you try to do something new. So that would be like the intrinsic reward that I just talked about. But that's not what they did. Any ideas? Well, yeah. I see there is an ordering information in one test, like if you click mm -hmm. run and then press OK. So uh, I think if you can uh, match the different space between the test and the image, uh -huh. That's exactly what they did. Good, uh, good uh, point. So uh, I'll rephrase, uh, but um, basically you see the instructions here, right? Um, and the instructions here also appear on the screen. So what they did was they recognized the text on the screen. And if your next image on the screen covered more of the text and the explanation, uh, you got a reward, essentially. So they actually give you a little bit of a hint in this image here, too. You see the gray part? This is the amount of text that is covered in the instruction. Uh, so based on that, um, they, they calculate the, uh, the reward. So I thought this was super you know, clever. It's like you're going through the manual. You see whether the next, like you've, you see whether you can see your next instruction somewhere on the screen. And, and based on that, uh, you calculate your reward. So I thought this was a really cool, uh, really uh, interesting uh, paper. So I highly recommend it. They also did this for like playing Civilization, the the um, uh, the computer game as well, in their 2010 paper, I think. Um, and uh, yeah, um, there's also neural network uh, based models for like following instructions and, and doing actions uh, as well. Um, there's lots of examples of this recently, but this Misra et al. paper is one is one example of this. Um, so for MT, uh, for sequence to sequence models or MT, there's lots of examples of using reinforce to optimize uh, things like blue score. And some examples of that I've cited already. Um, there's also a, um, a few examples of making incremental decisions in MT. So uh, one example that I, I myself have worked on, so I think it's kind of a cool uh, problem, is uh, simultaneous speech translation. So the idea is you're, you're speaking, uh, someone's speaking a sentence, and you want to start translating before they finish speaking their sentence. Because if you wait until they finish speaking their sentence, 
um, it might, uh, you might have to wait a really long time before you translate. So um, one example of this is a simple reinforcement learning agent that has two actions. One action is read in the uh, read in words. Another action is to output words. So basically, um, uh, you read in the first part of the sentence, and then once you're pretty sure about how to, how to translate, uh, you can write out some of the sentence, read more context, write out, read some in, write out. And the reason why you need this uh, reinforcement learning for this, essentially, is because um, uh, you don't know the whole sentence before you have to start writing things. So this is a... Um, uh, so this is an example where you, you would actually need reinforcement learning and couldn't do it with some of the other uh, methods that I mentioned before. Another cool example, um, this example is also uh, from Regina Barzilay's group. Uh, uh, sorry, yeah, I'll go back. What did the reward function look like here? What did the reward function look like here? That's a good question. So um, uh, a simple reward function that you could think of would be blue score. Um, and blue score would basically give you uh, you know, a, a better score for better translations is, there's kind of a, a big problem with that in this context. Can you, uh, it's, essentially it doesn't encourage you to go quickly, right? You could just wait until the very end of the sentence. You could read everything in and then write everything out. Um, so what you do instead is you give a reward that, um, that looks like blue score, but you basically give some, uh, a bonus for translating things before you listen to the whole sentence. And, there's a couple of uh, example, uh, like types of this, like latency blue. Um, I forget exact. This is my own paper, so I should remember exactly what we used, but I, we didn't use exactly that. But, uh, but uh, basically, that's the general idea. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, RL for information retrieval. This is also for, from Regina, Regina Barsley's group, uh, who did the uh, Windows uh, Windows example as well. Uh, they have very creative ideas about how to apply RL to, uh, to NLP. But basically, um, for information extraction, this is extracting information about news articles or something. Um, and what they did was they had, um, uh, they wanted to extract information about news articles. And for example, in this case, uh, they want to extract the shooter's name and also the number of people who were killed uh, in this, according to this news article. And Unfortunately, the news article you have is a couple and four children. Um, that's not super easy to get the number six from this. So what they do is instead, um, they say, okay, I, I don't know the number of people killed. I'm not very confident in this. So I'm going to go out and search the web uh, and find other examples and, uh, of the same news article. And then in the other examples of the same news article, they have six. Um, uh, and you also have things like Scott Weisterhaus shot. So um, the idea here is basically you use reinforcement learning to decide whether you need to go out and make an expensive web search in order to solve this uh, information extraction task uh, as opposed to just using what you have. Other examples in search are performing query reformulations. So basically this means um, uh, if you get a particularly difficult or ambiguous search query, uh, do you try to reformulate it into other, uh, into other uh, wordings? And uh, they use reinforcement learning to decide whether to do that as well. <clears throat> Another nice example is for question answering. So in this case, um, question answering uh, over large documents can be very expensive. Uh, like let's say you're running uh, your your BERT uh, by tree LSTM model over it or something like that. Processing each sentence can be, uh, can be quite costly. Um, so uh, the idea here is basically you use a very cheap model, uh, maybe a, um, you know, a word embedding, sum of word embedding space model that you can calculate very efficiently for the entire uh, sentence. Um, and then you do sentence selection, where the sentences you choose is a latent variable. And then based on that, you take the document summary and run an RNN or your very like, expensive model to solve, uh, to solve the problem here. So this is, uh, this is another example that I think is, is kind of interesting. Um, I think there might be ways that you could do this uh, without reinforcement learning as well, but uh, that, that's the tool that they, uh, they chose to use here. 
Um, finally, this is not exclusive to NLP, but it's, um, it's kind of a, a general idea that could be applied to NLP as well, and they applied to NLP in their experiments. Um, this is uh, re reinforcement learning to learn uh, neural network structure itself. Um, so the basic idea is you generate a neural network architecture, uh, try it, and measure the results uh, as a reward. And um, based on this, uh, they basically designed uh, recurrent neural network cells, like LSTMs uh, or GRUs or something, um, where the model could uh, kind of compose its own recurrent neural network cell. This is what it ended up with. I don't know why. Um, I don't know why you need identities either. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but this happened to work, and it actually happened to generalize to other tasks that you didn't have in here. Um, some people call this general kind of learning meta-learning, but I feel like meta-learning is a very broad thing that can cover lots of, uh, lots of uh, things. So it's also called neural architecture search, which I think is a more, uh, um, a more uh, precise name. Um, OK. So I, I would like to go back a little bit. So let me go back to. Um, this exploration versus exploitation uh, thing. And let me use an example of one of the, uh, of one of the uh, tasks that we just had before. So I'll go to specifically this task of uh, course-defined question answering. And what I want to stress is you can come up with a pretty good but not great uh, policy for something like this. So um, let's say you want to do question answering about an entity and you have its Wikipedia page that you can do the answer from. And let's say the answer is in the first three sentences 80% uh, of the time. At the very beginning of training, it's very easy to come up with a model that essentially always selects the first three sentences. Um, your sentence selector learns at the very beginning of training to select the first three sentences. And it gets 80% accuracy, which is pretty good, right? You know, it's not a, or, you know, 80% modulo the, uh, like, the fact that the answer generation RNN isn't perfect. So it gets 80%, uh, around 80% accuracy. But in fact, there's a, a better policy that gives you 100% accuracy, right? The only problem is, you also have your answer generation RNN. And maybe your answer generation RNN has only learned to extract the type of answers that occur in the first three sentences of, the, uh, of Wikipedia. And the answers that occur in the other parts of Wikipedia, actually, um, you need a different type of question answering model to solve them. So basically what happens is you get a policy that generates the first three sentences, gets a high reward, generates other sentences, and if, even if the other sentences don't um, even if the other sentences don't uh, or have the answer, the answer generation RNN hasn't learned to generate an answers for these sentences very well yet. So you get a low reward. So there's this kind of really bad interaction between your upstream model that does some sort of reinforcement learning and your downstream model that's helping provide your reward. And it's very, very easy to fall into these local optima uh, where you learn kind of a simple policy that does pretty well instead of the the better policy that does, you know, really well, I guess. And this has happened to be 10 times in 10 different research projects. It's a really, really big problem. Um, but as long as your downstream model here is trainable in some way, if it never gets data to train from, it's never going to learn well. So, um, like, if it only gets kind of trivial inputs, it's only going to learn to handle these trivial inputs. So this is a really hard problem. I don't know how to solve it. Um, if you solve it in a general way for your pro course project, I'll give you an A+, plus, I promise. So. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I guess that's about all I have for today. Are there any uh, questions? Or... Okay, I will finish up. We're a little early, but that's...